At the beginning of the summer 2013, people in Vietnam were eagerly anticipating the premiere of a locally produced movie called Boi Doi Chalon, The Street Children of Chinatown. It was a formulaic gangster-style action film, the sort of thing Vietnamese people have seen a hundred times on pirated Hollywood DVDs, and in local cinemas for that matter, but they were excited for it because it was set in the Chinatown neighborhood, Cholon, of Ho Chi Minh City, and because it was a relatively rare Vietnamese production instead of a foreign import. It had several well-known local celebrities in it, and it had been promoted heavily for weeks. But just a few days before the mid-June opening date, officials with the Ministry of Culture's Censorship Committee canceled the release of Boi Doi Cholon. They said it was too violent, and that it didn't reflect the social reality of Vietnam. So that weekend, everybody went to local cinemas to see World War Z instead. It's not like this had never happened before. Vietnam has a long history of censoring popular entertainment. A year previously, in 2012, the same government office banned all in-country screenings of the Hunger Games on a similar premise, that it was too violent. What officials didn't say at that time was that the Hunger Games depicts a people's revolution against a repressive, corrupt government of self-serving elites intent on keeping its people poor, ignorant, and powerless. Can't imagine why. But where people had taken the Hunger Games decision in stride a year before, something different happened last summer. This happened. Remixes and mashups of Boi Doi Cholon's promotional poster began appearing online. Technically unsophisticated but clever parodies subtly mocking the ministry's decision. Of course, they included the obligatory remix of Hitler reacting to the news. Other versions took a confrontation between two rival gangs that appeared in the film's online trailer and tweaked it, before censorship and after censorship. A site that remixes panels and characters from the Japanese manga Doraemon took that idea, modified it, and posted its own version. In a recursive, iterative cycle, these and hundreds of images like them were created modified, and shared thousands of times on social networks in Vietnam, especially on Facebook, which has in fact been blocked in Vietnam at the DNS level since 2009. They appeared in the many online discussion forums so popular there, such as Web Chai Te and Tente, where the news of the Hunger Games being banned came and went without much fanfare a year before. This time the issue didn't go away. It was kept alive as every time someone shared one of these images, another conversation about it started. And not everyone agreed the film should have been shown. There were lots of online comments defending and justifying the decision to censor Boi Doi Chalon. That's not surprising, but it is unusual, because these very public debates and conversations about this sensitive topic, censorship, a matter of public policy, hadn't really existed a year before. It's also interesting because the Vietnamese creators of these images and the people who shared them didn't make their point with angry blog posts written in all caps, but by using the language of remix, pop culture, and humor. Vietnam, of course, is East Asia's other rapidly developing autocratic communist state. Like its neighbor to the north, Vietnam undertook quasi-free market reforms a couple of decades ago, and now it's in the midst of an economic boom. It has a huge emerging middle class, and an internet penetration of nearly 40% among its 92 million people. Incidentally, Vietnam is the world's 13th largest nation by population. True fact. As in China, all media in Vietnam is at least partially state-owned and very tightly restricted, and authorities there have a habit of jailing outspoken bloggers on charges of abusing democratic freedoms and spreading propaganda against the state. Last year, 61 Vietnamese citizens were given lengthy prison terms for peacefully expressing themselves on the internet, more than any other country in the world, save one. Unlike China, though, Vietnam's internet is relatively open. Google and YouTube are among the top visited sites. Most of the social media platforms that you and I use are available there, and despite the block on Facebook, more than 27 million Vietnamese citizens use VPNs and technical workarounds to update their statuses every day. That makes Vietnam netizens the heaviest users of censorship circumvention tools in the world, according to a report earlier this year from the Open Technology Fund. It also means that roughly 70% of Internet users there have a Facebook account. In the U.S., that figure is 55%. In Australia, it's 57%. 
It's also important to keep in mind that for generations, Vietnam has nurtured a collectivist Confucian ideology that places national development, political stability, social harmony, and respect for authority above almost all individual interests. A great firewall has never really been necessary there. Between the chilling effect of regular arrests and imprisonments and decades of social conditioning, political commentary on the web has been understandably rare. It's considered dangerous, pointless, and at least among many older citizens, un-Vietnamese. But that's changing. For five years, I taught a course called Asian Cybercultures at the Saigon campus of RMIT University. In spring of 2013, I noticed that many of my students had begun citing examples of user-generated content and remix from a new image-sharing website calling itself HiVL. The name means funny in Vietnamese, among other much naughtier things. The users of HiVL, which seems remarkably similar to sites like 9gag, had begun churning out silly troll faces and template memes with Vietnamese language captions. These images spread out across the Vietnamese web with astonishing speed, partly because social media could be seen as an affirmation of everything a collectivist culture holds most dear, and also because today's Vietnamese youth, who've come of age in a globalized, internet-connected society, are very different people from their parents and grandparents. They outnumber them, too. Nearly 65% of the current population is under the age of 30. But there's another reason these images spread out so quickly. At almost exactly the same moment last year, as many of you I'm sure will recall, Facebook introduced a new function allowing users to comment by posting an image alone, without any accompanying text. This changed everything in Vietnam. In a place where the wrong words can land you in jail, there's a powerful sense of security in being able to express yourself to thousands without having to write anything at all. Almost overnight, meme culture blew up there. Pretty soon, HiVL was giving Google and YouTube competition for web traffic. Clones of HiVL sprouted like mushrooms, and remixers began getting more creative. This is the Tweet Bitch Collection. It's a Facebook page that first appeared about a year ago, and now it's approaching half a million followers. The Tweet Bitch Collection specializes in remixing Disney animated film stills and characters with Vietnamese text and complex references to the social and pop culture ecosystem. They post several of these a week, riffing on the kinds of issues that all young Vietnamese people can identify with. Money, family, love, sex, the lack of sex, viral web trends, popular news stories. They tend not to engage in overt political talk. But in an authoritarian state with no civil society, in which every moving part is explicitly controlled by a single political party, pretty much everything is political by default. A typical post from these guys gets 20 or 1,000 likes, a, a few hundred comments, and as many as 1,000 shares. I know global brands that would kill for that kind of engagement. Tweet Pitch is two young guys, both with full-time jobs, who do this on laptops out of their bedrooms in their spare time. This all puts me in mind of what new media scholar Ethan Zuckerman of the Berkman Center for Internet and Society has called a cute cat theory of digital activism. Among other things, this theory suggests that ordinary online tools and platforms, the kind that people commonly use for sharing innocuous content, like cute pictures of cats, for example, make it possible for non-activist users in places like Vietnam to create and disseminate what could be perceived as activist content. And that seems to be exactly what's happening here. I would guess that very few of the thousands of young Vietnamese who participate in all of this think of themselves as activists with the political agenda. They're just kids communicating in the way that seems most natural to them about things they find interesting and amusing. The tools of remix and meme culture are by nature innocuous. Most of the stuff from Tweet Bitch is created in PowerPoint. How much less threatening can you get than the ancient aliens guy? On the surface, it all appears to be just harmless fun, and therefore inoffensive to both government officials and, crucially, to other citizens. The medium of the message allows indirect social and political commentary to sneak in disguised as laws. It also assures that the content is shared and viewed much more widely than direct critique would be. 
Between the two poles of the starry-eyed techno-utopians on one hand and the skeptics on the other, there are scholars who suggested that the real potential of online tools for social empowerment in places like Vietnam is not necessarily in coordinating massive street protests or mobilizing activist movements, but instead how they enable citizens to articulate and debate a welter of conflicting ideas throughout society. In other words, social media may matter most not in the streets and the squares, but in the myriad spaces of the social commons that Jürgen Habermas called the public sphere. Habermas's public sphere, of course, has come in for its share of criticism, as has the idea that online platforms might serve as one. But these images and the worldviews behind them are becoming a part of the national discourse in Vietnam, and in the process they are quietly, incrementally shifting the zeitgeist. You can call HiVL many things, but you can't call it bourgeois. One more example. Last fall, Vietnam's top health official badly bungled her ministry's response to a series of vaccine-related infant deaths. This time, the remixers drove the online conversation again with a flood of repurposed images. This one is an imaginary new national stamp supposedly created to honor the health minister for her service, but it just wouldn't stick. Online commenters had great fun explaining that's because people were spitting on the front of the stamp instead of the back. Photos of the minister, not the world's most attractive woman, were given an endless variety of satirical captions. Twit bitch, of course, couldn't resist joining the party. Another popular version was a mock advertisement that had the minister endorsing a potent anti-shame cream. A favorite of mine was a get-out-of-trouble-free card for government officials. Use in dangerous situations to avoid penalties of all kinds. Unlimited usage. After several months of this, a mainstream online newspaper, the Petro Times, published an op-ed respectfully suggesting that the health minister might consider stepping down. This was the first time in the history of modern Vietnam that a state-controlled news outlet had openly called for the resignation of a senior ministry official. Within just a few hours, the op-ed had been removed, relegated to the memory hole, but screen grabs of it continued to circulate around the web. In a press conference not long afterwards, a top party official was asked on the record if he thought the health minister should resign under the pressure of Vietnam's, quote, online public sphere. He said no, go figure. But the fact that the question was asked at all is remarkable. Vietnam is hardly the only place where this is happening. We saw it just a few months ago in Turkey after their prime minister tried briefly, unsuccessfully, to block Twitter there. In Singapore earlier this year, after a photo emerged on an online portal of a national serviceman's housekeeper carrying his field pack for him, remixers photoshopped the woman into an endless array of military scenes, a jab at the perceived privilege of wealthy service members. Youth in India and Indonesia during those nations' historic 2014 elections made regular use of memes for everyday political discourse, and social networks in both places continue to throb with irreverent mashups and remixed image macros. Most of us recall the digitally modified GIF images portraying North Korea's Kim Jong-un engaging in ridiculous, most unsupreme leader-like behavior. This genre of GIF humor became hugely popular on a range of Chinese online platforms in 2014. The members of ISIL have become known in recent months for their sophisticated practice of co-opting hashtags, themes, and meme templates familiar to those from whose ranks they seek to recruit budding jihadists. Yodo exclaims one series of images that plays on 2014's popular YOLO hashtag. You only die once. Why not make it a martyrdom? At this very moment, scores of remixed images and videos, many including the iconic umbrella of Hong Kong's pro-democracy protesters, are sweeping the internet, not just in East Asia, but across the globe, generating worldwide support for a few thousand student hopefuls standing up to the might of China's central government. Artist and internet commentator An Xiaomina of the Civic Meet calls meme culture the street art of the internet. She's po pointed out that Weibo users in China have been using internet memes to circumvent and mock government censorship for years. They can even jump the rails of the web and burst out 
into the real world where their impact is even stronger. It's often said by way of criticism that these images are amateurish and juvenile and short-lived. And that's true. But they appear to be achieving what all the finger-wagging from the dissident bloggers and Western democracies has not. They're changing minds. And they're doing so precisely because they are amateurish and ephemeral and, yes, often silly. That's the whole point. What does all of this mean for Vietnam's future? Well, if we're expecting to hear Square or Gezi Park or Occupy Central to break out in Hanoi anytime soon, that's unlikely to happen. The Vietnamese have had enough of violent revolution to last them for a very long time. But as scholars like Clay Shirky and Zanap Tufeci and Ethan Zuckerman have suggested, perhaps it's time we stopped focusing so much on the high drama of social media-fueled protest and started considering instead these tools' roles in capacity building. It's a mistake as well to look at all of this through the lens of Western assumptions and expectations. Culture is everything. A young Vietnamese friend said to me recently, the revolution is beginning here, but it will happen in a Vietnamese way, not a Western way. And Vietnam may yet surprise us. Last November, a few months after the meme community went apeshit over the censorship of Boi Doi Chalon, and just a year after The Hunger Games was banned throughout the country, the second film in that franchise, Catching Fire, opened in hundreds of Vietnamese cinemas without a word from the censorship committee about it being too violent or too anything. Thank you.